<clears throat> Welcome everybody to the bridge. We're so grateful uh, that you're here for Easter. One of the traditions that um, kind of pastors and everybody does around Easter is they do something like this. They get up on the stage and they say, he is risen. And the people who believe uh, that he is risen, they say he is risen indeed. This is a tradition for 2,000 years and we're gonna keep it going today. So if you believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, I'm gonna say he is risen. And I need with all gusto that you have, you respond with he is, in ris he is risen indeed. You ready? He is risen. Okay, good job, 11 o'clock, proud of you. Uh, you should be proud of yourself. Um, we're so grateful that we get to spend some time together. I do wanna take just a moment because we're only a four-year-old church and one of the things that's been such a blessing to us is we have a um, independent school district that has been so kind to us. So Herf Elementary opening up to us in all of years, 2020, which is amazing, and then Bernie High School opening up to us and now Champion opening up for Easter. I am just so thankful to live in a community that we do. So would you mind just helping me thank BISD for having us here, it's such a big deal. So, so grateful. What I love, love, love about Drew's story um, is, I don't know if you caught it, but in the middle of that story, um, there is one question that Courtney asks. Um, one question that she asked that literally had the kind of thing in it that would change his life forever. I don't know if you caught the question, but the question was this, would you go to church with me? It was one question that this one question literally turned everything and Drew, who was once this, is now this because Courtney was willing to ask one question. Um, what I love about life is you've probably had a few of those questions in your life as well. Maybe you've asked a few questions or maybe people have asked you a few questions, but probably all of us have three to five questions that have been asked to you or you ask that changed everything, the trajectory of your life. I remember very distinctly in 2006, I was in Glorieta, New Mexico. I was uh, kind of at what's called the washeteri. It's where you went and washed your clothes. But I was reading through Romans and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I said, Lord, would you save me? Would you reconcile? Would you make me new? And Jared Patrick from 2006 is not the same person that I am today. Um, God really did go into my heart. He really did change me, the Holy Spirit inside me that I'm not perfect. And by a long shot, you can talk to Meredith, I'm not even close but I'm not the same man I used to be. And this one question literally changed the trajectory of my life. Fast forward just a few years, I met a girl named Meredith Hutcherson and we started dating and I, she very quickly realized that I was the man she wanted to marry. And so I was like, let's go, okay? So I, uh, I started putting together my plan and she's not very good with surprises. And so I wanted to surprise her with the, uh, the proposal. And so at the time she worked at Bernie High School, she was the dance instructor there. And, um, and I decided to surprise her with the engagement um, and so my, her friend picked her up from Bernie High School, drove her to Bernie's Town Square. She was wearing her Eskimo uh, Moe's shirt from, right, from Oklahoma. Uh, so that was the surprise. And so I just bent down and proposed. And I said, will you marry me? And I did not know um, how dramatically my life would change for the better with just that one question. Like, she's incredible, y'all. I, I, I want you to get to know her. She's one of the best people you will ever meet. And she's made me such a better man. I'm not the same person by asking that one question. Then, um, probably three years later, I asked the question, should I switch from my Mizuno MP14 blade irons to Titleist AP2 with a different shaft? So let's not try to be big and do extra stiff, but I decided to go to new irons. And y'all, I'm just telling you, asking that one question, my life has never been the same. <laughs> it's amazing. The trajectory is so much better. Not my golf game, but the, like the four iron, the way it comes off. It's just, okay, let's move on. Like the best question I could possibly ask. As we look at the story of Easter, Luke 24, that often in Easter we look at, there's actually one question that's in the middle of the story that stands out like a sore thumb if you're looking for it. It's one question that has the power to change our life in a pretty big way. And so I want us to look at Luke chapter 24, if you have your Bibles today. If you're visiting with us for the first time, what we normally do on Sunday mornings is we just open up God's Word. I try to read it. I'll explain it as we go. Um, and then we just try to apply it to our lives. And there's no difference at Easter. It's not rocket science. We're just going to look at God's Word, see what it has for us today on Easter. And I think that alone is really powerful. So Luke 24, if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be back here on this incredible screen um, that's incredibly bright, so you'll be able to see it there. Luke 24, the story of... Easter. Verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, we're going to find out in verse 10 that this is women, came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. Now there's a lot of reasons to really love this first verse in chapter 
24, but Luke tells us that it is the first day of the week. This is important, um, maybe, maybe not, but in those times, they didn't have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They had numbers. So it was day one, day two, day three, day four. So um, you just learned something here at Easter. Sunday was day one. That was the first day of the week. So the first day of the week in their context was Sunday. Sometimes we think the first day of the week is Monday because it's our jobs, but it's not. Sunday was the first day of the week, number one. But it also tells us this. It was very early in the morning. Now, a little digging reveals that this is the fourth watch of the night. So this means it's anywhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So very early in the morning. I'm not sure how you feel about the time change, but I don't know how. Like, we should do something about it, y'all. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something about it. Somehow this one hour change, now all of a sudden I sleep three hours later. I don't get it. It's really weird. But this one moment in their time, very early in the morning, it's very dark. The implication that I think Luke is trying to get here is it's very dark outside. Now, if it's dark outside, we know that this dawn right before the sunrise is when it's technically the darkest. So he's trying to tell us that physically it's very dark outside. But from these ladies' perspective, it's also very dark inside. That this is a very dark moment in their life. It's what one theologian calls the dark night of the soul which all of us have had. We've all been there at one point or another where it's the dark night of the soul. It's important to realize that they have not yet witnessed the resurrection. This verse does not exist in a vacuum. We have to understand the week that they just experienced. They've been following this man named Jesus for over three years, following his every move, listening to his every teaching. And then Jesus comes into Jerusalem with a hero's welcome. Everyone's so excited that Jesus is there, but then he starts preaching, which can take a quick turn. And they all of a sudden don't like what he is saying. Then Jesus, one of Jesus' own disciples betrays him. Another disciple denies even knowing him. Jesus is falsely accused in a phony trial. And then the verdict is given that he should die. And so Jesus, who these ladies loved and followed, walked up a hill to Calvary, died on a cross, the most brutal of all deaths. This is where we find ourselves in the story of Easter. That he died the most brutal of of deaths, brutal of deaths, right in front of these ladies. Then a guy named Joseph opened up his tomb for Jesus and wrapped his body in 75 pounds of linen. The thing you have to consider in this text is the ladies gave their lives and put their hope in this man named Jesus, and he is dead in a tomb. So they are depressed, they're exhausted, they're mourning, and quite honestly, they are without hope. It's hard not to let what we know now of what we're celebrating right now not soften what these ladies are experiencing. And so obviously there's some practical application for us. What do we do when we feel exhausted, perhaps mourning, and maybe even feeling without hope? What I love about these women is the fact they are just taking their next step. They're not staying still. They're just gonna put one foot in front of the other. And we see here in the story, as Jesus always does, he takes the darkest of situations and brings light. You see, they didn't know it, but there's a sunrise coming. It feels like it's the darkest moment of the night, and it is, but the sun is coming up. And even though they don't know it, everything is about to change. You see, no matter the circumstance, there is nothing a good resurrection can't fix. I'm actually believing that for many of you, you too are walking in a darkness. Maybe a darkness of without Jesus, or maybe you're walking with Jesus, just depressed, exhausted, mourning, and even feeling sometimes without hope. And I believe that Jesus wants to bring you out of that darkness and into his light. Look what happens in verse 2. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is an interesting thing. Certainly, you want to go really quickly to, oh, well, the tomb is empty. But we need to pause for a minute. There's something happening here that I think is really practical for us today. The ladies are very confident that they would find a closed tomb they were, they were confident they would find a dead body and they didn't even know how they were gonna get in, but they were just going for it. But when they got to the tomb, what they were expecting is not at all what they found. So let's think about that just for a minute. 
on a practical note for us as believers and non-believers in the room. Often, Jesus does not meet our expectations, but he always meets our deepest need. Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations, or we don't always know exactly how he's going to respond. I haven't been a pastor very long, but I have come to realize that many come to Christ expecting him to act a certain way and to answer all of our prayers. But that's just not how Jesus works. The moment you think you figured out God and his ways is the moment that he smiles. It's important to know that God always takes care of our greatest problem, but not always our current problem. Be careful of what we're expecting of Jesus. I think this is the thing that all of us need to wrestle with on this Easter. It's maybe you're angry that God did not do exactly what you wanted him to do. And just to be honest, that's understandable. I understand that. However, to try and understand God, the God of the universe, is like trying to fit the ocean in a solo cup. Scripture tells us that his ways are not our ways. Now, I'm also not naive to this. The reason, I mean, I don't know if I, whenever I said that I asked Jesus into my heart and heart and Glorietta, I didn't tell you exactly the context around it. The way that I got there was because of the circumstances that was going on in my life. Just a few months prior to being in Glorietta, my dad was killed in a car accident. And in this moment, I was not following Jesus. I was trying to pursue a golf career. I was trying to make everything that I could of myself. And I actually asked God to save my dad, but he didn't. And so it threw me into a spin. I was really angry and I didn't really understand. I told God what to do and he didn't do it. And I had questions, I had doubts, I had anger. And do you know what God did? He didn't take away all my questions, but he saved me. He didn't answer all the questions that I have, and quite honestly, I still have some, but he changed my heart. He made me a new person. And now almost 20 years later, I realize that God used that moment to change my life forever. And there is something that I've wrestled with since then. There was a man who came up to me at my dad's funeral, and he said, Jared, I just need you to know this. I've never talked to this man since. I need you to know this. The greatest day of your dad's life was the day he saw Jesus face to face. At the time, it made me incredibly angry. 20 years later, it's what I hold on to. It's my greatest hope that one day I too will see Jesus face to face. Although I asked God to do something, he didn't do it, but it was the greatest day of my dad's life. And I really would not be standing here today had that not happened. See, for all of us, sometimes we do have to step back and say, Lord, thank you that you didn't actually answer that prayer. Sometimes you do have to look back and see it. That's the issue. Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations, but he is good even if we don't see it at the moment. He actually heals our deepest need, but we have to ask the question, what is our deepest need? So the angels in verses four through seven actually tell us two things. It shows us the question of questions, but also the angels show us our deepest need. Maybe you didn't know there were angels. Verse four, check it out. While they were perplexed by this, Suddenly, two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. So here in this text, we find the question of questions. These two angels in the tomb ask a question that stopped these women in their tracks. And this question serves as both a correction and an announcement. They ask, why are you looking for the living among the dead? In terms of announcement, certainly this is what we celebrate at Easter. This is the first time revealed that Jesus is not in the tomb. This is a huge moment, a confusing moment, but this is the moment the angels first declare a risen Christ. Certainly the women don't understand, but they are about to. Jesus is not in the tomb. He has risen. But this also serves as a correction, a gentle one. They are asking the question, why are you looking for a living person among dead people? Why are you trying to find life in a graveyard? So from a practical standpoint, this is the question that all of us really should ask. Why are we trying to find life in a broken, dead world? This is the question that really should get to the bottom of all of our hearts because I know you better than you think I know you. All of us are looking to finally and fully be satisfied. All of us. 
We're all on a joy journey. We're all on a journey trying to finally and fully be satisfied. And here's how it looks. We desire to finally and fully be satisfied, so we try to get into that school. If I can just get into that school, then I will finally and fully be satisfied. If I can just get that spouse, if I can just marry him or her, then I will finally and fully be satisfied. And so all the married people laughed. (laughs) Or if I could find the perfect job, if I could just get that one job, then I will finally and fully be satisfied. If I could gather wealth just a little bit more, then I will finally and fully be satisfied. And if that doesn't do it, I will finally and fully be satisfied when we have kids. At that point, then I will finally and fully be satisfied. And once I have those kids, I'm gonna sign them up for every sport imaginable that Bernie has to offer, amen? And in that moment, when they perform, I will finally and fully be satisfied. So we take up golf or hunting or shopping on Amazon, whatever it may be. Now here's the deal, listen closely. In and of themselves, these are not bad things. These are great things. These are God things. These are things that God created but they were never meant to finally and fully satisfy you. They were never meant to finally and fully satisfy our hearts. You see, if you put the pressure to finally and fully satisfy you on your spouse, it is a crushing weight that they cannot stand under. They were never meant to finally and fully satisfy you. If you put that weight on your job or your kids or money or politics, God help us this year, hobbies or shopping or eating or all of it, it will never finally and fully satisfy you. The issue is this. We never finally and fully are satisfied until we've seen a risen Christ. That's the starting point. We're never finally and fully satisfied until we see Jesus. These ladies really needed to see an empty tomb. And many of us need to see the emptiness that is the world we live in. That we think it'll finally and fully satisfy, but it does not. Friends, the truth is we cannot put our hope in this world. It will always let us down. And once we find and see the risen Christ, then all of these great things finally make sense. Once I see Jesus, once I see that he loves me, that he loves my wife, that he loves my kids, that he loves sports, that he loves the world we live in, that he loves everything, then all of a sudden, this world makes sense. Once I see myself rightly in Christ, then my marriage has meaning and purpose. Then all of a sudden, my job actually has a meaning and purpose. All of a sudden, my parenting and my kids that God's given to me have meaning and purpose. Money actually makes sense. It's meaning and purpose. It's not God. Sports and school actually have meaning and purpose and so on. So be careful. That's the warning. Be careful not to try and make life make sense apart from Jesus. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Let's look at verse 6. The angel says this, Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. Now, what the angels just did, especially if you've been around the bridge a long time, they just presented the gospel in one sentence. This is the central message of everything. What the angels are explaining is what, what we call the gospel, yes, but that means that term means the good news. They are actually explaining the good news to these ladies, but we have to stop for a minute. It does not sound like good news. That does not sound like good news at all. It's something we have to wrestle with. But in order to get to good news, you always have to wrestle with the bad news. It's why the angel says it's necessary. It seems harsh and cruel. But the truth of the gospel is this. What seemed like defeat was actually victory. Jesus was not defeated in the tomb, but rather he was victorious. And it was all a part of God's plan. So the thing we wrestle with is why was it necessary and how is this good news? Why is this necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day? And how in the world is that good news? Well, I've thought about it like this. Um, The gospel really can be explained in really three circles. Whenever we talk about why it was necessary and how this is good news is you have to go back to the very first book of the Bible. Can anybody tell me what that, that book is? Genesis. I thought I'd lob you an easy one. It's okay. We'll get around in a little bit. Um, This is the good news of the gospel that in Genesis chapter one and two, you see there is God's design. Now, this is definitely certain, certainly something we wrestle with today in terms of God's design. 
When God designed everything, he designed everything, the world, the way it was made, the, the sun, the moon, the land, all those things. But then the last day he creates us, or the sixth day he creates us, man and woman. Just by the way, so you know, we live in a crazy culture. He really designed it. He really did design us as man and woman. He designed it in marriage. The way he designed it is the way we're supposed to operate. But God, in his, God's design, he created the world how it's supposed to work. And then as humans, what we did is we broke it mess it up just as fast as we possibly could. Right? Right, husbands? Okay. So he had about two chapters, and then you're two chapters in, and then all of a sudden we mess everything up. God said, hey, you're not going to eat from that one tree. And we did very, very quickly. And whenever we ate from that one tree, Adam and Eve, what happened was there was something that entered into humanity, which was called sin. So there is God's good design, and in this good design, you have to know that whenever he created it, it was in what's called shalom. And shalom means peace. This is when God and man are walking together. There is freshness. It is peaceful. There is no tears. There is no sorrow. There is no death. Whenever sin enters the world, then all of a sudden everything is broken. From the micro level all the way to the macro level, we are broken. In fact, we as people were born into sin. It's what we're called natural born sinners. And it's kind of funny, but you think about it, it's actually true. If you ever hang out with a two-year-old, you're like, oh, I see natural sin right there, right? Like, how did you lie at such a varsity level? Nobody taught you that, right? It's like, it's in us. That's what it is. So sin enters the world and it enters through us, through Adam and Eve, through us. So when sin enters the world, it brings with it what's called brokenness. And when sin enters the world, which is in us, it breaks everything. It breaks the world. It breaks human nature. It breaks all of it. And what happens in brokenness as humans, what we try to do is we try to find our life in everything outside of God's design. So we might try to find life in our job or our marriage or sports, whatever it is. And so it goes back to what the angels are saying. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? In brokenness is where we try to start finding our life. We try to find our identity in all kinds of things or money or anything like that. It's what's called brokenness. Now, what's so cool is if you start looking for it in Genesis chapter 3, there's actually what's called the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first time the gospel is proclaimed. God makes a covering uh, to cover Adam and Eve. And what he does is he makes a way for them to be back in right relationship with him again. That's called the gospel. You see it, especially from Genesis 3 on, but God is making a way for mankind to be back in relationship with him. So in the gospel, what we see is Jesus comes to this earth, he dies a death that we deserved because God cannot be in the same place as sin. Jesus dies on a cross in our place. He goes into the tomb very dead. On the third day rises and he goes back to glory and then we know he's coming back one day to save us. Now, this is the gospel. And what happens in uh, Romans, it tells us that all of us are sinners, we're in brokenness. And the gospel is this, what we have to do is we repent and believe the gospel. So in this brokenness that all of us find ourselves, we repent and believe. Now, you may have heard that term repent before. Um, it's used a lot. But all it means is we turn from something and turn to something far greater. It's returning from our life in sin and turning to Jesus. That's what we repent and believe. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again and that he brought me life. Then, in so doing, once we've received the gospel, we get to recover and pursue God's good design. So God designed everything. We broke it. Sin broke it. We live in brokenness. But those who repent and believe the gospel, our heart is actually changed. The Spirit's living inside of us. All of a sudden, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, is in us. We have a new heart. We are a new creation, Paul tells us. The old is gone. The new has come. We get to recover and pursue Eden. So certainly when we're saved, we get to recover and pursue God's good design. Now, the thing that I love about Easter is we get to look at the gospel in a fresh way every single time. And for some of you, you've never even heard the gospel, that it's not something you do, it's something that Jesus did. It's not that you pretend and perform, it's what Jesus did on our behalf. That's the beauty of the gospel. And for many of you who are believers in this room, the great thing that we get to do is we get to remember what God did and that we actually have a purpose, it's to recover and pursue to go back to Christ, to come back to Eden. And that's what we get to do at Easter. We get to remember the simplicity of the gospel, to be reminded of who we are in Christ. You see, there is something very powerful in remembering. In fact, here's what verse eight tells us. 
and they remembered his words. A constant discipline in the life of a believer is the discipline of remembering. You see, these ladies' lives are about to change forever. They're about to turn and go share the gospel with everyone they know. But before they do that, the angels pull them aside and say, think back and remember. You see, this is just helpful. Faith generally looks back before it moves forward. Regardless of where you are today, the past is what prompts praise when you're in pain. I wanna help all of us with something when it comes to faith. Faith always requires a big step, but it never requires a blind step. Certainly we take big steps of faith in all of our walks of life, but it's never blind. We get to look back. Sometimes like these women, the present is too painful and the future is too fuzzy. So what do we do? We look back to the cross at Christ, cross of Christ. The cross shows us that God can bring the best things out of the worst situations. And remembering who God is and what Jesus did is what gives us confidence in our next step. We move forward in faith because we remember his presence and provision in the past. All they needed to do was to remember his words, which for many of us is what we need to do today. today. Another thing that I see in this text that is so helpful for me is you notice that these women are together. You don't know this yet by the text, but the disciples, they're cowering in a house but they are cowering together. Both the disciples and these ladies are together. You see, our steps of faith never happen alone. Isolation is not something in Christianity. We need one another. Did you know, I learned something new this week. Did you know that the word encouragement does not simply mean to lift someone up? It actually means you're putting courage in them. It's in courage meant so that someone might have more courage. See, I think about it like this. What if Mary was just by herself? And she saw all of this just by herself. She might begin doubting herself. Did I really see this right? But that's not how it happens. She has others with her that are walking alongside her. Now, here's the deal. When doubt occurs, one of the things we have to, to realize is they, it's the ladies didn't hear Jesus the first time. They just didn't understand it the first time. He's trying to remind them of the words that Jesus said back in Galilee, and which is so helpful for me because ever um, I've felt like this as a believer before. Like, I don't really understand the word. This doesn't make total sense to me. And if you've ever doubted, if you've ever been confused at any time, you'd make a great disciple because these ladies don't understand it either. And so this angel is reminding them, which brings up this last idea. If only I had the faith of someone who witnessed the empty tomb with my own eyes. That's something that we tend to say at Easter. If only I could have seen the empty tomb. If only I could see it with my own eyes. But here's the deal you'd be shocked at how the others responded. Look at verse nine. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of Jesus, of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, who I love, favorite person in scripture, however, got up and ran to the tomb When he stooped to look in, he saw only linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Okay, two things from this last passage and we'll be done. First, God uses unlikely people to tell the world of his good news. I don't know if you saw this, but the fact that women were the first to declare the good news is actually huge. Surely today we see men and women have equal dignity and value, both made in God's image but we are definitely different in our makeup and our responsibilities. And that is in God's beautiful design, how he created all things. But what you see here is actually something really important. You see, in this time, and even in our day to day, many people think the resurrection was a hoax. Like they put this together, people got together and made all of this up. But the fact that all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share the same story, that women shared the good news for the first time is astounding. Why? Because if you're trying to make up a story, you would not start with a woman's testimony in this century. Now, I'm not saying it was right, but in those days, women were not able to own property or even testify in court. But God, he uses unlikely people to herald his good news from the very first minute. Friends, it's one of the most convincing parts of the resurrection for me, because if you, did, if you don't put that part in there, you don't make up a lie. People would say, if this is in there, then it's a lie. But here's the deal. Why is it included in scripture? 
Because it is exactly how it happened. This is truth. This is exactly what happened. But second, the second part of it, this is a passage that really helps me know what to do with my own doubt. Whenever I start doubting all of this, everyone will not be excited when you share the gospel with them. We know that to be true. In fact, our culture is adamantly against the message of the cross. We all know that people outside the church will doubt what we say. But friends, what do we do when we doubt as the disciples did? You see, if I'm honest, sometimes it's even hard for me to believe. It's why I love the passage in Mark's gospel when a father says to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You ever felt that before? We need to know that doubt is not at odds with our faith. Doubt is a part of our faith that we need to work through. The question is, we need to ask this, what do we do with our doubts? What do we do when doubt creeps in? Well, out of everyone, Peter decided to take his doubts and check it out for himself. What I love about Peter is he decided, if I'm gonna doubt something, I'm gonna doubt my doubts. If I'm gonna doubt something, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna doubt that. That's what we need to do, to doubt our doubts. Don't dismiss your doubt, don't throw it under a rug, but go look with your own eyes. Peter takes a step in the direction to find out for himself if this really was true. See, what we have to grasp today is don't assume that our doubts or our feelings are true. We oftentimes give up so quickly. And what I love is that Peter gets to the tomb and sees for himself that it is indeed empty. The others didn't see it, but Peter did. Friends, if you're struggling to believe, would you do me a favor? Would you follow in the footsteps of Peter? Would you actually do the work to check it out? Here's why. Because if you're going to reject something, I want you to reject the right thing. If you're gonna reject this claim, I want you to make sure you understand it. I don't want you to reject something that maybe you made up in your own head. I don't want you to reject something maybe that you read on Facebook because it's not the most true place. I don't even want you to reject it because of some feelings that you had or maybe how you were treated. Sometimes Christians, we get it wrong. I want you to go check it out for yourself. In fact, I love what Tim Keller said. He said, describe the God that you've rejected. Describe the God that you don't believe in because maybe I don't believe in that God either. Be careful when you reject God. Make sure you're rejecting the right one. Notice how Peter stood in front of an empty tomb amazed. If you'll do some digging, I promise that you too might be amazed. There's one book that was written by Lee Strobel. It's called The Case for Christ. Lee Strobel was an atheist, and he decided, I'm going to go out and I'm going to disprove this whole thing. And he did all kinds of interviews, he did all kinds of reading, and he came as an atheist to the, to the fact that the resurrection was true. And he wrote a book, he said, it's just the case for Christ. Now, I bought this on Amazon uh, on Thursday for 11 bucks. Uh, I bought 30 of them, so they're out in the lobby. If you want to look, like right now, I want to get this book, like go get it. This is my gift to you, I just want to give it to you, go read it. Because if you're going to reject something, I want you to reject the right thing. Not something that's in your mind, the right thing. Now, if you think about it, the resurrection begins everything because what happens next is unreal. Jesus appears to 500 people. Peter is restored. The gospel spreads like wildfire. And 2,000 years later, we celebrate on this day with over 2.3 billion people right now. What happened 2,000 years ago? It changed the course of human history. And so what I wanna tell you is this. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then nothing else matters. Like this is a silly hobby if Christ did not rise from the dead. But if Christ did rise from the dead, then nothing else matters. It changed the point of human history. Friends, we gotta understand that either the tomb is empty or Christianity is empty. So a moment of honesty for all of us today. No matter who you are in this room, like Peter, you have to do something with this testimony. You have to do something with the resurrection. You have to do something with Jesus. Can I just focus for the last minute on two words in our passage? Luke says that Peter went away amazed at what had happened. Did you know that Christianity is not based on what a few people 2,000 years ago believed? What the first Christians believed? Christianity is based on what the first Christians witnessed. They saw it with their own eyes. The thing that we all have to understand is we're not dealing with fables and fairy tales 
These women really did go to a real tomb looking for a really dead Jesus, but he really was not there. The resurrection is true. Jesus really is alive. And there is one foundational truth that we celebrate today. We celebrate at Easter that really hang, the, the, the hinge that all of this hangs on is the message that 5, 500 people gave their lives to. It's three things. Jesus has risen from the dead. We are eyewitnesses, and this changes everything. If Jesus rose from the dead and there are 500 eyewitnesses, that means he is who he said he is, he did what he said he was going to do, and this changes everything. Bridge Fellowship, it's why we exist to see a gospel movement that would reach every person. Because this good news is for every purpose, every person. And the purpose of Easter is not that we stop doing bad things and start doing good things. No, the purpose of Easter is that Jesus is alive and because he's conquered sin and death, we too can have life and life eternal. So this really does mean that your eternal destination can be changed today. It really does mean that anyone who would give their life to Christ can be changed forever. It really does mean practically that your marriage can be restored, that your relationships, your relationships can be reconciled, that addictions can be broken, even if they're secret addictions, they can be broken. This is the good news of Jesus. And so on this Easter, like these women and Peter, we have to ask the question, what are our next steps? Like, don't let this be just another Easter we have to ask the question, what are our next steps? And quite honestly, I think it's pretty easy. I think there are some in this room who you've never given your life to Jesus and you're finding yourself here trying to find life among dead things. And you are in brokenness. You have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What the scripture tells us is we repent and believe the gospel. He changes our hearts. He makes us new. Our life today and for eternity is secured. Maybe that's where many of you are today. You just have to repent and believe and let God change your heart. Where I think most of us are is right here. We need to be reminded of the gospel. We, are, we need to be reminded of who Christ is because then we get to recover and pursue God's good design. One of the things that we miss oftentimes in this is that whenever we recover and pursue God's good design, he always calls us in to reach the brokenness. When we are changed by the gospel, he brings us back to his design, but he sends us back. So if you have breath in your lungs, you have purpose. There is nobody in this room that like you don't have something to do. We all have people to reach. So you ask the question of who's far from God and close to you. That's who God put you on this planet to talk about, to talk to. We all have a purpose to live and to breathe. The question is, where do you find yourself today? Friends, as we say every single week, we believe that Jesus Christ is the ultimate hope for every person. And though we are all sinful and our sin separates us from God, God made a way for us to be in right relationship with him again. And that way is Jesus. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And God promises that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the good news of the Bible and that's the good news for Easter today. That Jesus really does love us. God really does love us enough to send his son on our behalf. Have you trusted him? Have you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ? because it changes everything. Have you considered the Easter story that Jesus really did go into the tomb very dead, conquering sin and death, rising on the third day that we might have life, restoring all things to his good design? That's the good news of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Father, today I pray that you would move in our hearts. Maybe some, Father, today are walking in darkness, whether it be depression or anxiety or fear, Father, I pray you'd break those chains. Father, I pray you would encourage our hearts, that you'd put courage in our hearts, that we might see an empty tomb. And we, like Peter, would walk away amazed at what had happened. That you really do love us. You really did send your son on our behalf that we might have life. Father, would you move among us today? It's in your name we pray. Amen.